Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my first looks review of the Fujifilm GFX100 Mark II, a medium format rearless camera with a new 102 megapixel sensor, improved handling, and 8K video. I spent some time with a final production sample, and in this video, I'll show you what's new along with sharing some images. I hope to make a more detailed report in the future, but in the meantime, I'll add updates and more sample photos to my review page for the camera at cameralabs.com. Announced in September 23 and costing around $7,500 or £7,000, it's the official successor to the GFX100 from 2019, while the more recent GFX100S from 2021 remains on sale at around $6,000 or £5,500. So while the GFX100 Mark II is considerably cheaper than its predecessor, the S version remains the most affordable way to enjoy 102 megapixels in Fujifilm's medium format system. That said, with the arrival of a new model, prices on the original GFX100 will inevitably tumble, so look out for deals or possible used bargains. Fuji fans will recall the original GFX100, seen here on the right, sported a built-in portrait grip, and while this was thinner than its main grip, it's inevitably made for a fairly hefty camera. Quite nice to hold though. Compare it to the new Mark II version on the left, considerably shorter thanks to not having a built-in portrait grip, and at just over a kilogram in weight, almost 400 grams lighter than its predecessor. The 100S remains lightest of all at 900 grams, but the new Mark II version is definitely closer to it in size and weight. For those who want something more to hold on to though, Fujifilm sells an optional battery grip for the Mark II, which accommodates two extra W235 batteries in addition to the one in the camera. That's three in total as well as providing portrait controls. It costs around £480, but you'll need to provide your own batteries for it. Here's how the Mark II, fitted with the grip, looks on the left, compared to the original GFX100 on the right. Since the new portrait grip matches the standard one in thickness, the overall height of the Mark II with the grip is now obviously greater than the original model, but I prefer the consistency in look, feel and handling, not to mention the chance to remove it when you need something more portable. I think it was the right choice to do this, although it does mean you do lose that second rear screen on the Mark II. Looking around the new camera, you'll find a lockable exposure mode on the upper left side with six custom presets alongside a switch to set the camera into stills or movie mode. On the upper right side, I'm pleased to see the Mark II still sporting a high resolution LCD information screen with 320 by 219 pixels, allowing it to display a wealth of shooting information while also letting you reverse the text and background color if preferred. As a dot matrix, it can be context sensitive too, and here's what you'll see when the camera's switched into its movie mode. I really like the look of the black text on the paper white background here. While most of the controls are similar to before, you'll notice a few extra function buttons scattered around the body, as well as a top surface that now slopes down a little towards you. It's a subtle but pretty stylish design touch that's not only fairly unique, but also means you don't need to angle the camera back quite as far or peer as much over the top to see the upper screen or dial. Before leaving the top surface, let's have a look at the viewfinder, which, like the original GFX100, is removable, but don't worry, still supplied with the body as standard. While sliding it off will make the body a little bit smaller if desired, the main reason is to fit the optional tilt accessory in between, which allows you to, say, angle the viewfinder up so that you can compose looking straight down. The Mark II uses the same tilt accessory as the GFX100, which means its new viewfinder module can also be slid onto the old camera, but sadly Fujifilm tells me it won't work as it employs a new, more detailed panel so the electronics aren't compatible. But this does mean that in a very welcome upgrade, the GFX100 Mark II joins the fairly exclusive club of cameras with viewfinders boasting 9.44 million dot OLED panels. And in this case, with a substantial one times magnification too, making it bigger and more detailed than the GFX100. It's just a shame that owners of the old model can't upgrade to it. The view when using the full magnification is pretty immersive, but if you prefer, you can gradually reduce the magnification in several steps down to 0.77 times to match the old model, at which point you can also double the refresh rate from 60 to 120p. Turning to the rear of the camera, you'll find a 3.2 inch screen with 2.36 million dots and a 4x3 shape, alongside a selection of buttons and a joystick which, in the absence of a D-pad, performs most of the navigation. The screen shares similar three-way articulation to earlier Fujifilm models, which means you can angle it up for waist-level shooting or comfortable composition from low positions. Or you can angle it down for easier viewing when held high. And you may have already noticed that it can be pulled out a bit further from the camera than before. 
This is so that you can accommodate the optional cooling fan accessory that was introduced for the latest XH models. And you may also notice the holes where it screws in. Or well, finally, by pushing a button on the left side of the screen, you can angle it out sideways for use in the portrait orientation. Sure, it still won't flip forward to face you or back in itself for protection, but I'm sure the target audience won't be vlogging with it. Right? On the left side of the body, you'll find the ports. Behind the upper flap is a gigabit ethernet port for quick tethering at a distance or FTP duties. Below this are a three and a half mil port that doubles as a microphone input or a remote jack, followed by full size HDMI, take that GFX100S with your micro port, and USB-C, the latter performing multiple duties, including recording onto an external SSD drive. Meanwhile, on the grip side, you'll find a headphone jack below which are dual card slots, one for CF Express Type B and the other for standard SD. The mount can accommodate the growing collection of native GF lenses, including the new 55mm 1.7 WR launched alongside it and seen here. With an equivalent coverage of 44mm, this will undoubtedly become a popular general purpose lens with a nice fast aperture. It costs around $2,300 or pounds. All lenses benefit from the improved sensor shift stabilization, which Fujifilm claims is now good for up to eight stops of compensation depending on lens. You'll need the GF 63, 80 or 110 mil for the maximum compensation, but at the other end of the scale, models like the 250 and 100 to 200 should still give you at least five and a half stops. The GFX 102 employs an improved back illuminated sensor, sporting the same 102 megapixels as before, but with light gathering efficiencies bringing a claimed 30% improvement to noise levels and dynamic range. This in turn allows a new base sensitivity of 80 ISO for stills, or 100 for movies, as well as faster readout to reduce skewing, and reported better face detect autofocus in the corners of the frame. I'll try to test all of these for a future video, but in the meantime, I'm going to update any findings on my review page at camelabs.com, so check it out if you're interested. Like other GFX cameras, the sensor measures 43.8 by 32.9 mil, giving it 1.7 times the area of 35 mil full frame and wider coverage from the same focal length lenses. They will need bigger imaging circles though. Now there's pros and cons to all formats and you'll need to weigh up not just pixel densities but pricing of both bodies and lenses as well as availability before finding the right system for you. But the bottom line is the GFX100 series can produce tremendously detailed images that are among the best that I've seen from any system under 10 grand. The Mark II also continues to defy expectations on medium format speed and handling too, now supporting bursts up to 8 frames per second. That's pretty impressive given the size of the images. Understandably, while the buffer has been enlarged, you will need a fast card to stop it filling up too quickly at these speeds, hence the addition of CF Express, which allows for much deeper bursts than SD memory, particularly if you're shooting in RAW. Meanwhile, the subject detection algorithms are inherited from the latest X-series cameras, which share the same X-Processor 5. So there's a separate menu for human face and eye detection, while other subject types are spun off into a second menu. These can successfully recognize animals, birds, cars, bikes, planes, and trains. Although like other X Processor 5 cameras, enabling one of these subjects will disable the human option and vice versa. I realize that the autofocus software was written at different times, but really all of the different subject types should be on the same menu. From the quality menus, you can choose a variety of image sizes and aspect ratios with the highest quality 4x3 shape at 102 megapixels, delivering files with 11648 by 8736 pixels. This gives it roughly 50% greater linear resolution than say a 50 megapixel sensor. You can choose to shoot JPEG or 10-bit HIF files and pick from three compression levels, any of which can be accompanied by a RAW file or just shoot RAW alone if you prefer. You also have the choice of lossless, compressed or uncompressed RAW files in 14 or 16 bits. As a Fujifilm camera, there is of course the full complement of film simulations, including the new Riala Ace mode, described by Fujifilm as being a little like a slightly less saturated Provia without going too far down the retro road. I wonder how many actual films they've got left to simulate on future bodies. Before you comment, I did ask if Riala Ace would come to other Fujifilm cameras with a firmware update, but sadly they couldn't confirm or deny at the time that I made this video. Sorry, I did try. Beyond this, you get the other options familiar to X-series owners, including color chrome and grain. If 102 megapixels aren't enough for you, there's a pixel shift high resolution mode, which captures 16 images while subtly shifting the sensor between each. 
These can then be combined in software on a computer later to generate a file with up to 400 megapixels of information. Although you do need to be very careful with your technique, your choice of lens and your settings. Sadly, the composite process still requires using a computer later, but new to the Mark II camera is an optional mode which captures just four images. This effectively allows the system to demosaic the color filter array, and that in turn should eliminate or reduce color moiré artifacts. But you're getting a more manageable 102 megapixel image at the end, plus only having to store four in the meantime. Moving on to video, the GFX 102 can change format from the native GF, which uses the full sensor width, to smaller format lenses, including Premister or 35mm lenses, including anamorphic. In terms of movie quality, you can film 1080 or 4K from 24 to 60p, and in 16x9 or wider DCI shapes. There's also Cine 5.8K from 24 to 60p in a wide 2.35 to 1 shape, as well as 8K from 24 to 30p, again in the choice of 16x9 or DCI. 1080 is also available up to 120p in the high speed menu. 8K video is new to the GFX 102 and incurs quite a substantial crop of 1.42 times in DCI or 1.51 times in 16x9. This crop factor confirms that 8K is simply taking a one-to-one -one pixel crop from the middle of the sensor. You can encode video in a variety of formats from H.264 and 265 in 4 to 2 10 bit to external ProRes or Blackmagic RAW in 12 bit. There's F-Log for grading and also the welcome addition of both vector scope and waveform monitor displays. Pretty classy. The Mark II also supports IDT for ACES Cinema, a standard color space which allows you to match footage with dedicated professional cinema cameras. Nice. I hope to make a follow-up video taking an in-depth look at the movie quality in the future, so do look out for that. But in the meantime, here's how footage looks in 1080-25p, filmed with a new 55 1.7 lens. And now at 1080-50p, followed by 1080-100p, accessed from the high-speed menu. Before briefly returning to 1080-25p, to allow a direct comparison with 4K at 25p, Know that the lens hasn't changed in any of these clips, so if you see an adjustment in the field of view, that is down to a crop. Next for 4K at 50p. And now for the Cine 5.8K mode with its wide aspect ratio. And now back to 4K 25p for comparison, before finally switching to 8K to illustrate that tight crop. But as I gradually zoom into the 8K footage on my 4K timeline, you can see the potential for detail. And finally, a quick rolling shutter test. First in 1080 25p, before switching to 4K of 25p, and now Cine 5.8K, and now for 8K at 25p, where the slower readout and crop both result in much more visible skewing, so do be careful when using this resolution. As I wrap up this video, I'll show you a few images that I took with the GFX 102 and 55mm lens, but as I mentioned earlier, this is a first looks video, and I plan to make a more detailed one in the future, so keep an eye open for it. In fact, shortly after this video goes live, I should have already added more sample images to my review page for it at CameraLabs.com. So do head on over there for my latest updates. And that's pretty much all I can say until I spend more time with the GFX 100 Mark II. Now, there's no denying that it can deliver fantastically detailed images with the color and tonality that you know and love from the X-Series. But what makes it stand apart is the handling. Sure, it's still no sports camera, it's not meant to be, but by shrinking the body, improving the IBIS, enhancing the autofocus, and boosting the burst speed, the GFX 102 redefines what we can expect from medium format in terms of overall handling. I'm also obviously glad it's more affordable than its predecessor, and don't forget there's always the S version if your budget is a bit tighter. And as GFX prices gradually reduce, and those on flagship full frames creep upwards, Fujifilm's medium format system becomes a viable option for more of us to seriously consider. And that's it for this video. I'd love to hear what you think of the 100 Mark II and the GFX format in general in the comments, and whether you'd consider it over, say, a high-end full framer. There is a lot to weigh up between them. As always, if you enjoy what I do, you can help me out with a like and a follow to make sure that you don't miss out on future videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.